So everybody, welcome uh, very much to, to our Lunch and Learn this month. Um, I'm excited to be the person welcoming you today. Um, we have some exciting One Health announcements. Um, the first is that we have a complete seminar schedule already for all of 2021 posted on our website. And so if you go to our website and homepage and the seminar page, you can get advanced, uh, exciting warning and invite your friends to come to this wonderful lecture series. Um, we also have a Twitter account active. So we are now UT1Health on Twitter, all one word. I don't know if capitalization matters on Twitter. I suspect not. No, nope. excellent people who actually know about Twitter are shaking their heads. That's fantastic. Um, okay, we also have a fun podcast series that's been launched already by comedian and science enthusiast Shane Moss. Um, Shane has been doing the Here We Are uh, podcast for a while and has now started focusing and interviewing our UT One Health scholars. And episodes are available under our media uh, uh, podcasts path on our One Health website. Um, so yay for attention to UT One Health outreach and communication and, and all of our scholars for participating and all of our wonderful guest seminar speakers, uh, including today's seminar speaker, Dr. Eric Lofgren. Um, I am very pleased to, to be introducing Dr. Lofgren and I'm going to read his formal introduction, but also just as a personal note, Eric is an awesome scholar and a really interesting person. And I encourage all of you to reach out to him after his talk. Um, all right, Dr. Lofgren is an infectious disease epidemiologist whose research focuses on the uses of mathematical and computational models of disease transmission, particularly the transmission of antimicrobial resistant infections within and outside healthcare settings, as well as emerging infectious diseases. His work often focuses on producing policy relevant results, working hand in hand with clinicians and policymakers to produce reproducible quantitative guidance for designing and evaluating public health initiatives. He is currently an assistant professor at Washington State University School for Global Animal Health. He holds a PhD in epidemiology from UNC Chapel Hill and did his postdoc with the Network Dynamics and Simulation Science Lab at Virginia Tech. I'm very pleased to welcome him to talk to us today about dirty doctors and pestilent puppies. Eric, it's all yours. All right, thank you very much, Nina. We'll go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully you can all see that. So yeah, yep, the, the, the title of this talk is Dirty Doctors and Pestilent Puppies. And that's really sort of an encapsulation of what I work on is I sort of work on infection control problems, mostly in humans, sometimes in animals. Um, like many modelers, I just sort of wander around doing whatever interests us at the time. Um, and I am at the Paul G. Allen School for Global Animal Health, which is a mouthful. It's going to get a little smarter, uh, a little smaller. We're, we're dropping the animal and we're just doing global health. Uh, here pretty soon, uh, but I, I work in sort of both areas. Um, and I actually like to start with an acknowledgement slide. Um, so a lot of this is done with uh, my clinical collaborators, Dev Anderson and Rebecca Mooring at Duke University and David Weber at UNC, who is responsible for my interest in hospital FE at all. Um, much of this sort of came about um, thinking wise while I was a postdoc under Stephen Eubank at NDSSL. The COVID in jail work um, is a product of a Large collaboration with Nina, uh, Christian Lum at the University of Pennsylvania, Aaron Horowitz and um, Brooke, I confess I don't know her last name, at the ACLU, and Kellen Myers, who's at Tusculum. Um, and then the hardworking graduate students of my lab, Matt, Caitlin, and Stephanie, who are the folks pictured on the side of the screen, all looking very outdoorsy. And so, yeah, who am I? Um, I have a PhD in epidemiology from UNC Chapel Hill, so I was sort of trained as a conventional, like, let's go estimate a relative risk from a cohort study epidemiologist. Um, I did my postdoc at the Network Dynamics and Simulation Science Lab, which at the time was at Virginia Tech, which is a, a group focused on very large sort of agent-based modeling of um, primarily human social systems, and I now work at WSU. I primarily work, work on what I call policy-driven modeling problems, so these are problems where there is some sort of clinical or policy stakeholder that needs an answer to something. Um, this is what Pullman looks like if you want to live in a place like this, where it is dry and beautiful for most of the year. Please do come join us at WSU. So this talk is sort of a play in three acts, and um, that will touch on sort of parameter estimation for hospital epidemiology using chlorhexidine bathing as sort of a motivating example. Uh, COVID-19 in incarceration settings and infection controls and antimicrobial resistance in companion animals as kind of a, a 
wandering through the work I do and sort of some of my thoughts on the global health and one health as an idea. So act one. So hospital epi has some data problems. Um, and the, the sort of the core question that, that engages me a lot is what if we know something is going on, but our data isn't great? Um, this is a problem in hospital epi. And then you go talk to the poor disease ecologists or the wildlife disease ecologists in the room and they go like, you have data? And they get really excited. So, so this is a, an interesting thing where regardless of who you talk to, they're convinced that they don't have enough data until you get to like the people who are doing cardiology clinical trials who are like, we have 300,000 people in each arm. We, we know everything. Um, so a lot of examples for this from Hospital Epi for the work I do is a single sentence from a paper that is about something else. So a lot of the like parameter estimates and the things I get really interested in papers are sort of that first sentence of the results section where people just sort of write down sort of the properties of the cohort they studied and then they get on to what they're actually interested in. But it's that like first sentence that's that's really important for me. Um, a summary statistic or a set of summary statistics, but not the individual level data. When you're working with human data, it's often very hard to get that. Even when there's not HIPAA problems, there's, you know, yeah, but we're going to mine this randomized trial for like four more papers before we give it to other people. Or information that is on one scale when you need it to be on another. So we know things about hospital wards, but we want to know about individual patients in that ward. And I am what the New England Journal of Medicine lovingly refers to as a data parasite, which is I do research on other people's research um, without necessarily paying them for it. Um, <laughs> primarily by trying to extract things from the existing literature. So one of the ways we do this is with a method called approximate Bayesian computation, which um, I primarily like because it works the same way my brain works, but it's also a really cool tool. And in its crudest form, what you do is you, speci you specify a prior distribution for some parameter you're interested in. So you say this probability is somewhere between, you know, 25% and 75% likely. That's going to be my um, prior distribution. You draw a, a value from that prior and you throw it at your model and you simulate your model a bunch of times. And you say, what I want you to do is tell me whether or not it matches some summary statistics. So an average number of cases or the time at which someone gets an infection, you accept the parameter. If the simulated results are close to your target by some tolerance epsilon, and you can use a bunch of clever techniques like particle filtering or other algorithms to improve the computational efficiency of this. But the smaller that epsilon gets, you get closer and closer to a Bayesian prior. But if it's greater than zero, this is an approximation of the prior. Um, this is really cool because importantly, it's like purely simulation. You have to do absolutely no math or statistics. You just sort of chuck computing power at this, which is how all science should be done, Nina. And why this is useful is theoretically you have likelihood-free inference. You don't have to specify the likelihood function of your model or your fit to the data. Um, this is handy if the likelihood is very complicated or tends to not converge well. So if you're using sort of exotic likelihood functions that don't converge nicely, you can sort of skip them. Or if you simply don't know the likelihood function um, that you, it doesn't, it's not well specified. And acceptance, the nice part of the, about this is it can be made using summary statistics. So you can work on an average or rate, something like that, instead of trying to fit to individual data, you do lose some information when you do this. Uh, you can even do this with sort of qualitative patterns, which admittedly you use you lose lots of information when you do that, but you can say things like, I want to make sure my model of bird migration has the birds leaving at the right time and coming back at the right time. And that's often very difficult to constrain a model that way if you're thinking about using likelihood-based methods. So that's really nice. Um, Graham and Railsbach refer to this as pattern matching. Um, and it's a, it's a really sort of interesting approach to things. Um, this does involve giving up some information compared to directly fitting to data. But in many of the cases that I, I think about, this has already been done for us. We've already lost the information. The information cannot be gotten. So doing something that involves a loss of information isn't as much of a sort of downside as it, as it initially feels like. Practically, um, I find this relatively um, straightforward to think about and implement. You can, the sort of the basic algorithm for this is, is relatively straightforward to code. And you can sort of double dip when you work on sort of improving the code for your simulation engine. It also makes your fitting faster. And so that's, that's sort of a nice 
bonus as you you sit down to think about whether or not it's worth trying to make your simulations faster is it will make fitting faster too so my initial reaction to this is like this can't actually work this way um but as it turns out this has actually been something that's been proposed for a long time so so Rubin proposed the idea of simulated priors but computing power wasn't there yet and computing power really is the the main limiting factor beyond this, everything beyond a toy example needs some form of a high performance computing, preferably parallel coding. And this is a major drawback for, you know, students in, in global health or public health or, or veterinary medicine um, saying, okay, you're gonna need a cluster account is somewhat daunting as a, as a first step, but it is, it is an important one. So we're gonna use um, chlorhexane bathing as sort of a motivating example of, of talking about how we use this and why it's interesting. So chlorhexine, if you, if you don't know, is a disinfectant with a, a broad range of effectiveness. It's used fairly widely in both human medicine and veterinary medicine. If you've ever had oral surgery and then had a absolutely disgusting tasting green mouthwash, that was probably chlorhexidine. And this is commonly used in hospitals as part of a daily bathing procedure to reduce hospital acquired infections, especially in intensive care units. And it's been shown to be effective separately or as part of a bundle of interventions in a number of randomized clinical trials. But in some community studies, like one I was involved in um, with some folks at Duke, the results have been somewhat more equivocal. So they found um, reductions in some hospital infection uh, related conditions, but not all. And there's a couple different sort of explanations for this phenomenon. It's there's questions about whether this was sort of already improving con infection control standards that obfuscate the effect of this. Um, I have some questions about the idea of facility level confounding by indication. There's there's definitely some different constructs there that might work. Um, so, but we're interested in sort of why those uh, sort of discordant results exist because whenever you have observational studies and randomized trials that don't agree with each other, there's there's interest there in figuring out why. And then the other reason that, that I'm interested in sort of figuring out how chlorhexidine works is that in many sort of intervention studies, there's this end of the sentence is like, oh, and then also we introduce chlorhexidine baiting. And they want to attribute all the effect they see to whatever they intended to be studying, but I want to know how much of it might be the chlorhexidine. So this is very common. Um, contact precautions are sort of a controversial topic in hospital epidemiology, whether or not, you know, we should all be wearing gowns and gloves when we, we contact our patients. And there are groups that have argued anything from sort of universal gowning and gloving. So everyone is on contact precautions all the time to you can get rid of gowning and gloving for everyone but patients with active infections. And when these people do these studies, it's often, well, we, you know, we got rid of all the gowns and gloves and we added chlorhexidine bathing. And then they want to talk about the effect of getting rid of the gown and gloves. But what I want to do as a modeler is sort of disentangle those things to be able to look at the effect of, of both. So this is an example of one of those sort of equivocal results where um, you have the sort of chlorhexidine rate is going down already. Uh, there's a little statistical artifact um, because of sample size. And then it keeps going down once we've introduced chlorhexidine. But if I was, you know, the CEO of a hospital and I looked at this slope and then you told me, oh, it's going to cost, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars to introduce chlorhexidine bathing, I'd go, ah, I, don't, I don't know that we need to do that. Why don't we just keep doing whatever we were doing beforehand? So the, the question that comes up for, for this study is, can we estimate the per use effectiveness of chlorhexidine? So basically when we you know, take a chlorhexidine wipe um, and then we wipe you down, if you're colonized with MRSA, what is the probability that you're no longer colonized? And this is useful for trying to be able to understand those differences between things like a null effect versus an underpowered study untangling bundled interventions. This is this is sort of a, an important number to know, but it's really hard to estimate from empirical data. If you think about how you do this in reality, you'd have to find someone who's colonized with MRSA. You would have to um, sort of pick a site on their skin, bathe that skin with chlorhexidine, uh, sorry, sample that site, then pick another site nearby, but not so nearby that the sampling has already influenced your, your skin flora, pick that site, wipe it down with chlorhexidine, then sample that site, and you'd have to do this while the person was in the intensive care unit, presumably because they're sick. And so this is very hard to do, even in sort of academic settings, but in community settings, it's, it's a very hard ask. And so it's, it's hard to estimate purely from empirical data. And so the idea was let's use a mathematical model and approximate Bayesian computation to estimate this colonization parameter instead. So this is a three-step process. I like things that come in threes because 
it turns out human beings like things that come in threes. So step one is sort of a pre-intervention fitting of an ICU to, to some data. So what we have is we have sort of a metapopulation model of a hospital where you have, um, I believe this one is 18 patients who are seen by a single dedicated intensivist and who are all supervised by six nurses who are assigned primarily to three specific patients. So sort of a continuity of care um, level thing. We have another whole um, preprint somewhere looking at what happens when you start poking at this structure, but this is the structure we use for this. And so what we're fitting the, the ICU data to is there's one free parameter in our model that's how we sort of calibrate to the experience of real hospitals. And this is the probability of successful colonization of an uncolonized patient due to contact with a contaminated healthcare worker. So basically, this is if a nurse or doctor has MRSA on their hands and they touch you, what's the likelihood that you get colonized from that contact? And what we fit this to is there was a study, the Benefits of Universal Gowning and Gloving, or BUG study, that had a very, very detailed um, sort of rate calculation for their pre-intervention colonization rate in their hospitals. And so we have that as sort of one of the best, what is the infection rate in an ICU before you do anything um, infection rates? So that's what we, we fit this to. We also, there is a very slow spontaneous decolonization rate that's been observed in some other studies. We put that in. And yeah, we use this stochastic metapopulation model of an ICU. I'll, prevent, I'll present a more simplified diagram of this later because essentially trying to show all the compartments for this model in a figure starts to break down very quickly. Um, and from here, what we essentially do is we simulate a series of interrupted time series studies to try to get at this question. So what we're fitting in this model is this blue line. And this is if anyone works in mosquito control and you're like, this looks a, a lot like a Ross McDonald model. That's because it is. So what we have is we have S, which is uncontaminated staff. And we have H, which is staff that have contamination on their hands, their bodies, something like that. And contaminated healthcare workers can contaminate uncolonized patients. So that's those people in U. Those people in U then go from U to C and they're colonized. And then they can contaminate the hands of uncontaminated staff. So that's how you move from S to H. So the important part of this model is that the patients aren't giving each other infections. We're assuming everyone's in a single room Otherwise, you're otherwise, you've got good infection control policies. There's no environmental contamination, things like that. And so really it's just this contamination question is what's driving infection. And the first thing we're fitting is this blue line. And that's what gives us the rate that uh, a real ICU sees. The next step is to add chlorhexidine bathing. So this is to estimate the probability that a chlorhexidine bath results in full decolonization. And here, um, this is where I mentioned, you know, you can steal summary statistics. There's a very thorough meta-analysis um, from the Journal of, Clinical, Journal of Critical Care in 2016 that estimates an um, incidence rate ratio of 0 0.75, basically, so a 25% reduction. And the question we're asking is, what value of the parameter we want to fit would result in that corresponding decrease of cases? So this is a picture of, of those particular studies. Um, the table isn't really important, except you'll note we're leaving three studies out. We'll get to those three studies in a moment. And so we're fitting essentially this green line here now is, is the line we're looking at, which is the parameter of you going back from colonized to uncolonized. Now there's a step three, which is mupiracin. So mupiracin is a nasal um, decontamination process that often takes place alongside chlorhexidine for full decolonization. Staph lives very happily in your nose, and so even if we decolonize your skin, it's possible you will then touch your nose and recolonize yourself. So we need to essentially get up in there and kill everything in there too. And several large studies have included both. That same meta-analysis essentially said for those studies, you have an incident rate ratio of 0 0.578, so basically 0 0.58. And so there's an additional reduction in the studies seen that use mepiracin. And so we need to now estimate both of these effects. Note that this does assume the effect of these two treatments is additive. So you know, you can you could do one, you could do other, you could do both. The both is just the effect of one plus the other. We've started to look at what happens if you sort of relax that additive assumption, but that the answer is the math gets much, much harder. And so that's these um, three studies that we left out. And the important one is this study by Susan Huang, which is why we wanted to include this, 
is because there's about 100,000 individuals in each arm of the study. This is most of the data we have about fluorhexidine is contained in this single massive randomized trial. So throwing that out because they also included mupiracin is kind of a problem. So that, that's why we included that study and, and sort of added this mupiracin component. So now we have basically a new purple arrow along with the green arrow, again, getting you back from colonized to uncolonized. So the caveats and assumptions to this are because all models have caveats and assumptions is we assume random mixing within the patients that the nurse sees. So you they sort of bounce between their three patients and then rack, random mixing between patients and the intensivist. We're only examining chlorhexidine's effect on decolonization. So the idea here is that chlorhexidine reduces colonization pressure by decolonizing potential infection sources, but it's not self-protective. If we give you a chlorhexidine bath, you're not equipped with like a MRSA deflector shield. Uh, we've looked at the effect in another study of, of that sort of deflector shield idea, and the answer is that it's okay. Um, we also assume there's an instant detection of acquisition. So, you know, we, we find and know perfectly whether or not you have MRSA, and we're sort of counting things appropriately. We relax this assumption in, in some of the results I'll show in at a latent period of between one and four days where you're colonized, but we don't know it yet. And that sort of changes the answers, but not much. Colonization is an all or nothing process in this. You are either colonized or you're not. There's no like, eh, it's, it's growing, but it's, it's not quite there yet. Everyone is treated. So for simplicity, everyone gets a chlorhexidine bath every day. And the other one, and this is sort of for the observational epidemiologists in the room, there's an assumption that the mix of interrupted time series and randomized clinical trial study designs that are included in this meta-analysis are both capable of estimating an unbiased effect. So essentially neither group is, is somehow systematically wrong and we can just take their data as is and use it. So the results we get from this are the, the figures on the left are um, chlorhexidine and mupiracin. The figures on the right are when we add that latent period um, and the answer is the per sort of application efficacy, which is this median line, is about 18% for both, if you assume we know perfect um, sort of detection, and about 15 if we don't. So this actually came as a surprise to me, because this means this isn't actually very good at what it's supposed to do. You know, we, we bathe you once, and there's a less than 20% chance that you're now clean. Um, that's a little bit worrisome, given we do this to people in the ICU all the time. But what it turns out is, is that if you just do this a lot, it works really well. Because one of the things that we had also been asked um, by a clinician is, can I space out the timing of bathing for chlorhexidine? Chlorhexidine is associated with skin irritation in adults, and it's associated with neurotoxicity in infants. So there's definitely an interest in like, could we only do this occasionally and still get something out of it? And so we varied this from sort of this baseline, which is we never do this, to 24 or 48 and all the way up to sort of five days. You know, you, you get a, a bath once every business week. And the answer is you still get benefits from this. So essentially, if you apply an okay intervention a lot, even if that a lot is, is less frequent than you otherwise would, you still get benefits from this, which I think is sort of an important um, message. And the takeaways that you that we, we got from this study are that the per use effectiveness of chlorhexidine and empiricin is surprisingly low, but there is a, a sort of caveat to that, which is these estimates are, they're not lab estimates, they're effectiveness, not efficacy. So they're both based on the actual chemical action and importantly, the application. And I think the application is where we as a field sort of have some weaknesses that we can improve on. For example, chlorhexidine. Um, there are many sort of apocryphal stories about um, nurses adding a um, soap to chlorhexidine because chlorhexidine isn't a surfactant. When you wash someone with it, it doesn't produce suds. And people want to see sort of suds when they're, when they're going through bathing. The problem with that is soap deactivates chlorhexidine. So if you add soap to chlorhexidine to make suds, what you've done is you've made bubbles, but not chlorhexidine anymore. And so that's sort of a problem. And then similarly for um, mupiracin, I, I went to a talk with Susan Huang and she described the process of decolonizing someone with mupiracin in her study. And it's essentially a nurse sticks a swab with mupiracin up your nose, sort of rubs it around in a circular motion for two or three minutes, and then does your other nostril. Um, this sounds like possibly the most awkward thing I have ever heard. 
And so my question is, is that is that what's actually happening in these studies? Or is everybody doing what probably happens, which is you just sort of get both nostrils, you sort of go around for a bit and then you're done. And is that enough application time for me, Pearson? Things like that. Um, so that's that's the real question we have is, is how much of this is application, but there's room to move the needle there. This is not sort of these 25% or sort of 40% decreases in infections that we're seeing in hospital units. This isn't the cap of how well decolonization can do. There's, there's room for more there. And the good news is, is that some flexibility in application frequency still has a positive effect. Um, if you're really interested in going into detail on this, this did finally get published in JAMA Network Open. Um, the URL is down below. It's trivially easy to find by typing in JAMA Network Open Lofgren. There's only two papers there. So act two, we're gonna shift gears entirely and we're gonna talk about COVID a little bit because I'm sure everyone is not yet tired of hearing about COVID work. And so we wanted to look at COVID-19 in jails. Um, COVID-19 has been a huge problem in jails, prisons and detention centers for reasons that I don't think require sort of particularly brilliant epidemiology. You have lots of people in close quarters with not particularly good access to hygiene, no real infection control, no real social distancing, and highly shared environments. So we were particularly concerned that essentially we're preserving this one setting with potential for super spreading because it's sort of socially and politically uncomfortable to talk about. You know, we have closed movie theaters, we've closed schools. Um, WSU sent all our, our students home for, for the semester. And then like, but jails, do we still need to deal with those? And it turns out the answer is yes. And so this modeling work that we were looking at here was looking at inter interventions to try to reduce COVID-19 in jails, um, doing work with both university and um, NGO collaborators in this case, um, the ACLU, who were really helpful in sort of informing what was feasible interventions and helping with, immensely with parameters. I'm not an expert in incarceration. Um, I hadn't ever sort of worked in jail settings before. So they were useful both for, you know, putting us in contact with experts who could say things like, yes, this is how a jail works. No, this is not how a jail works. You know, you just saw that on TV. And also feasible interventions on sort of both sides of things, things that you can't do that because that's sort of a violation of someone's constitutional rights. Or also we shouldn't spend a lot of time talking about this intervention because that's not politically feasible. It's never going to happen. So what we did is we modeled a largely idealized system, a city at the start of its COVID-19 outbreak doing everything otherwise well. So they have a social distancing and sort of work from home order and people are complying with it. And most of the parameters here are drawn from Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, due to a particularly detailed amount of public data about their jail. Um, expressly, this means it will not predict a single city or jail, despite an immense desire from people to have it do that. We, we can't sort of plug in Knoxville's numbers or Los Angeles's numbers and like turn the crank and tell you how many jail cases you're going to have. It's not meant for that. It's an idealized system. And so what we do here is we model the jail and community sort of interface and the fact that jails are highly connected to their communities. Jails are essentially short-term um, facilities. Most people are intended to return to their um, community. They often do so very, very quickly. And so what we essentially have is another metapopulation model where in the community we have children, adults for three categories, low risk, high risk, and elderly, and then the jail staff. And they cycle between these categories. The children in our model can't be arrested. So the jail staff um, move to the jail and stay there for eight hours and then go home. And the low risk, um, high risk, and elderly adults can be arrested. They go to a, um, a different sort of population, which is processing in court. This is, you know, your court dates, um, being processed to get put in jail, being processed to get taken out of jail, things like that, and then put in jail itself, and then they can cycle back to the community. What we see when we do this is, is a phenomenon we've called carceral amplification, which is this idea that because we have this highly connected, very sort of powerful source of infection in the community, uh, sorry, in the jail, both you see a very large spike in cases in the jail that happens before the community, but then this will also feed cases into the community. And so essentially you, you have this engine that's driving infection transmission and you get a very scary epidemic curve for the jail itself, which unfortunately we did see some very scary epidemic curves for jails in this particular outbreak. Um, and we looked at a lot of different potential questions. The first one I'm presenting here is sort of this question of, well, could we just do social distancing? Can we, you know, 
we can we space prisoners out? Can we give them soap? And will that, you know, work? And the answer is that even when you get to the equivalent of a population sheltering in place, while that would certainly help, you still get a very large spike. And in the community, it mostly just delays the epidemic. And in the jail, it slightly reduces the magnitude of the epidemic and delays it, but you still have a very large sort of epidemic. So it's not enough to just spread people out, which is what I think um, some facilities were hoping for, is we could just do social distancing and, and we'll be fine. So then we looked at some other scenarios, looking at things like um, arrest reduction. So this is essentially um, sheriff's departments and things like that, using some discretion to say, look, we're not gonna arrest you. We're not gonna send you to jail. Here's your court date. You better show up on that court date. Um, and we looked at a number of different scenarios for this. So the dark blue line is what happens if the community it is, as a whole is just sheltering in place, but we don't do that. And then we sort of step through progressively more extreme versions of bail reduction. Uh, sorry, arrest reduction. The first one is bail eligible. If we think we're eligible, if you're eligible for bail, we're just not going to charge you for bail and send you home. This one is a pretty easy one to justify. It's essentially like, we're just not going to make you write a check, but we otherwise think that yes, you can be in the community, you're eligible for bail. Um, the salmon line is what if we send vulnerable people home? So we look at you and we say, you know, you meet some of the criteria for people who are vulnerable to COVID-19. So you're elderly, you have lots of sort of comorbidities surrounding your, your cardiac system, things like that. What if we don't arrest you? Um, the sort of pale blue line is low level offenses. So this is offenses against property, not people. What if we send those folks home? We say, okay, don't do that again, but like, we're not really worried about you being a threat to other people. And the final one is just, what if we just arrested fewer people? We just say like across the board, arrest fewer people. And what we see is that in each one of these, essentially the more people you choose not to arrest and send to jail, the better your health outcomes are. So you have huge reductions in the incarcerated population, but you also see fairly substantial reductions in, in both infections, hospitalizations, and death in the community. And even in staff, which admittedly is sort of the hardest um, needle to move in this is, is infections among, among staff. So the takeaway we, we have from this is that COVID-19 in jail is a threat to both the jail itself and the surrounding community. And that these two systems are very tightly linked and because jails are inherently very permeable settings. Most people are there for short stays. A lot of those people are only there for a day or two, which is just enough time to get COVID and then return to your community and get everyone you live with sick. Um, some control efforts may be detrimental if they discourage case finding. So I, I didn't show that in, in this one, but essentially if you punish reporting that you're sick, which some jails did sort of implicitly do by turning their um, isolation, ward, uh, isolation cells into quarantine wards, which is not a very pl pleasant place to be quarantined, that discourages case finding and that in encourages people to wait until they're obviously ill, which is um, extremely detrimental to sort of all infection control processes. Increasing distancing helps, but it doesn't fully resolve the problem. And importantly, that's impossible in crowded jails. So if, if your jail is already at capacity, social distancing isn't really something you can do. And so decarcerization efforts are important both for being more effective themselves and to enable that increased social distancing for those who must remain in jail. If there are individuals who we say, look, this person does just have to be in jail, the less people who don't have to be in jail, the easier it is to keep them um, socially distanced and um, from um, getting sick. So act three, the final act of this, is the role of companion animals in infection control and antimicrobial resistance. So infection control and antimicrobial resistance in veterinary populations and settings is very similar to in human settings, but you have less money and your patients can't talk. And it turns out both of those things are actually really, really big challenges to infection control in, for example, veterinary teaching hospitals, which WSUs is this, this lovely building um, on the, the right-hand side of the screen, which is about 10 feet away from where I work. And one goal of my group is to examine infection control in these settings. And this is largely in higher, uh, inspired by a Klebsiella pneumonia outbreak at the WSU Veterinary Teaching Hospital, where this is a pulse field gel of essentially there was an outbreak of Klebsiella in 2009 all the way to 2011 that was pernicious and very hard to deal with. And, but then we, we dealt with it, it was 2011, we were finished. And then in 2016, a dog shows up 
with a strain of Klebsiella that is smack dab in the middle of the outbreak strain. Um, and it's five years later, and this is a little bit confusing. And so the question is sort of, but where does the Klebsiella come from? Um, somewhere in Pullman, there is a chain of Klebsiella and pneumonia transmission that gave this dog essentially an outbreak strain five years later. Is this in humans? Like, is this just like, there are some elderly people and their dogs who are just passing Klebsiella between each other? Um, is this only in animals? Is there some sort of disgusting little puddle in the veterinary teaching hospital that just has Klebsiella living in it and we, we haven't found it yet? Or is it in, you know, both? Um, does the hospital know? So does Pullman Regional see cases of Klebsiella pneumonia? Um, we still don't know the answer to that. I do need to get around to finding that out. And then the, the question that sort of comes around with that is, what if you could combine infection control for human and veterinary populations? What if these two groups of people talked to each other, used their surveillance data accordingly, and, and sort of looked at this question? And so since I'm a modeler, the answer to this is, what if we just build a utopia where this happens? Um, so what we decided to do was build what's called a synthetic population of pet ownership. So this is a virtual population of people who own pets and their pets go to hospitals and they go to hospitals and we, we watch what happens. Lots of synthetic populations, which have been used in epidemiology, there's been a lot of them used for COVID-19, are constructed for fleeting, transient, and largely indirect contact. So in fairness, this is because they were designed mostly to model influenza, where this makes perfect sense. You know, you, you can sneeze on someone and get them sick. For looking at something like MRSA or a antimicrobial resistant E. coli, we need something that's built on more direct sustained contact. Um, we need something where, you know, touch in a shared environment is a much more important thing. And ideally, um, from sort of a, a project perspective, this would be suited for modeling as a standalone network or a sort of a synthetic catchment population for looking at um, community transmission for both veterinary or human hospitals. And it would also be nice not to reinvent the wheel. So what we did is we stole a model from some colleagues of mine, uh, Christian Lum, um, Samar Swarup, uh, Stephen Eubank, and James Howden, um, who were looking at um, <laughs> incarceration and using an agent-based model of uh, racial disparities in incarceration rates. And importantly, what they do is they create a synthetic population that builds affinities based on proximity. So essentially, they, they scatter people on a one-by-one -one grid, and they say, you, you know, make friends, you meet your future life partner, et cetera based largely on the people who are near you. And there's lots of ways to conceptualize this space. You can think about this as geography. You're more likely to sort of meet and be friends with someone who lives near you than far away. This can be affinity. So this can be, you know, you agree on two different axes of, of some belief, et cetera. And there's a pairing process. Agents have children based on population distributions, et cetera. And at the end of this, you get a synthetic population with parent, sibling, spouse, and close friend relationships, which we said are the kinds of relationships where you can foresee sort of MRSA transmission occurring, where there's that level of direct, um, direct sustained contact. So this is what this ends up looking like. You get a legitimate sort of family tree, and this is that one-by-one -one sort of affinity space once you run a clustering algorithm on it. And you can see that there's you know, distinct groups of people. You have communities. And so this is sort of what we're going for. And so our extension of this model is to add pets. Um, the first version will likely just have dogs, and we're working on that now, built primarily on national level statistics where we can, and then sort of collapsing down to Pullman level statistics where not, primarily is a zero inflated Poisson model, where we say, you know, you have a probability of either owning dogs or not owning dogs. And then for those who own dogs, we draw how many dogs you own from distribution. In my case, that answer is three. One of them is, is Felix here. And at the moment, we're not modeling animal-animal contact. So we're not modeling, for example, doggy daycare, although we are interested in this. And one of the questions we are interested in is modeling the type of ownership. So for example, Felix here is sleeping on a chair. This is the same chair I normally eat dinner in. So there's definitely a potential microbiome interaction there. Whereas someone who has an outdoor hunting dog, that relationship is probably much less sort of intensive. Uh, this work is ongoing, but one of the questions is like, okay, but but why add this besides that, you know, I can put cute dogs on slides? And one of the answers to that is we've actually seen COVID in companion animals. So in a, a study we did sampling 67 dogs in 46 COVID-19 positive households, um, we had clinical signs in uh, about a quarter of those dogs, and 43% of them were antibody positive, 
but all of them were um, PCR negative when we did nasopharyngeal swabs. So they sort of got COVID, but they didn't, they weren't good at shedding it. So it's, po it's likely that sort of the people gave the pets COVID. Um, and there was a weak association with some sort of behaviors that would make sense. Um, so if you share a bed with your dog or the number of humans with COVID in the household, those were both sort of things that were associated with a higher risk in the dogs. There's also a novel coronavirus currently emerging among domestic dogs in Malaysia right now, suggesting that we should also be focusing on domestic animals in addition to One Health's often very wildlife and livestock centric approach, um, essentially because companion animals have very high contact rates. There's similar antibiotic usage patterns, for example, a lot of dogs when they're treated for sorry, antibiotic sort of uh, susceptible infections get people drugs. And um, so there's, there's sort of a, a, a question there with drug usage patterns. And so there's, there's, there's room for looking at companion animals as a potential source for either transmitting disease or just carrying it along with them as fomites. So, you know, if you have MRSA, you pet your dog's ears, your dog is not very likely to get MRSA. It is, however, likely to carry that MRSA on their ears for a while. You know, you get treated and then you come back and you pet your dog's ears again and you've just recolonized yourself. So we have some other work in that area, um, working with a, a vet student here, distinguishing human-human, uh, human-animal, and animal-animal transmission in hospital settings. So essentially trying to look at a veterinary school and say, okay, who's giving who what? Um, direct observation of staff use and contact patterns in veterinary teaching hospitals. So getting some of the same parameters we have for hospitals, for veterinary teaching hospitals. Obviously this is on hold for COVID because as it turns out, I'm gonna have a bunch of undergrads follow a bunch of clinicians around. It's a terrible idea in the middle of a pandemic. Um, we're also working on some social contact surveys of Pacific Islander populations in both Washington State and Arkansas, and currently working on a contact diary survey of WSU staff and faculty to try to figure out if there are particular groups who, who did or did not sort of successfully reduce their contact rate um, while working sort of with our, our particular version of work from home. So thank you all very much for your attention. Um, my contact information, if you're interested in talking to me, is eric.lofgren at wsu.edu. I am on Twitter at, at germs and numbers, and I'm hiring at least one postdoc. So um, feel free to reach out. And a lot of this work has been funded by the uh, Modeling Infectious Diseases in Healthcare Program, or um, we have a contract with the CDC looking at this in healthcare, or the, uh, we have a National Science Foundation rapid grant to, to look at COVID-19 as well. Um, and yeah. Thank you all very much for your time and attention. Thank you so much. Um, uh, internet clapping. Um, I, so I think we have time for some questions. I don't know, do you want people to unmute? Do you want that to be a curated question experience? What, how would you like to handle questions? Um, I am happy with any of those approaches. Um, dealer's choice. All right, so let's let's try it and unmute and go for it. And if it becomes madness, I will start arbitrating. Anyone have questions? Feel free to unmute. Sure, I'll I'll start with the last last one point I made in the chat. <clears throat> Very interesting. Thank you. Um, you said the estimated efficacy of, of, of bathing the, 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 the individuals uh, was surprisingly low, but isn't that what clinical trials have shown? So the clinical trials show that the, the sort of reduction in overall sort of ward level infections were somewhere between about 25 and 40%. And so I think everyone, everyone is imagining when we do things that we do believe are very effective, we also get those sort of same numbers. Um, basically, a, a lot of sort of the aspirational sort of infection control um, reduction is about 25%. And so I think what it is is that we, we sort of perceive chlorhexidine as this very powerful tool. And I think that carries along with sort of an intuition that it should work really well. But you're right, it doesn't, it doesn't have to. It doesn't imply that it does that, especially when you think about how often it's applied that you can, you know, if you just do this a lot and it's just okay, you get a reduction that is just okay. Um, but I think a lot of people clinically and, and from, from talking to clinicians, this seems to be surprising to people. I think a lot of people are expecting chlorhexidine to be much more effective on sort of a per use basis. Okay, well, but I mean, again, in, it seems like the procedure is still 25%. So why would you expect it is more efficient? But okay, yeah. Um, I think it's that, 
people imagine that there's a lot of other sort of pathways that you can you can get infections through. Sure. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's I think it's fair. It's just sort of reflecting on people's reaction to this this work because I've I've ended up sort of presenting versions of this over the past four well, or five you years. You have one person who is not surprised, so yeah. now you can correct it. Well, that's excellent. All right, so I, I can I can uh, take inviter's privilege and ask. So I don't actually know that much about veterinary teaching hospitals. Um, from putting on my, my One Health Curious hat, how much interplay do you, is there between wildlife that is just ambient and in, in contact with animals that are then brought into, I assume not a lot of wildlife is brought into the teaching hospital, but, I, but that could be a false assumption, but I do assume sort of partner animals, domestic animals and, and agricultural animals are brought in. How much interaction is there in an average veterinary hospital among different sort of categories of animals that might have contact with truly that's a, that's, a, that's a good question. Essentially, is the veterinary teaching hospital itself sort of a, a mixing bowl? Yeah. Um, so, so for our veterinary teaching hospital, at least, um, the livestock animals and the sort of companion animals effectively have different wings of the hospital. Um, and indeed, sort of, even in sort of the large animal setting, most of the things we think of as livestock animals, so sheep, cows, llamas, etc., and horses are actually also separate. Uh, the equine ICU is very swanky. Um, for the companion animals, um, they're mixed together somewhat. So you can foresee sort of a, and they're, they're kenneled. So you can, for example, see, foresee a, there was a contact between some unknown wildlife and a dog that dog comes to the veterinary teaching hospital and now there's a lot of dog to dog contact. Um, and one of the things that has made sort of looking at, at veterinary teaching hospitals challenging is when we think about human hospitals, there's this, there's this idea of terminal disinfection. So when you leave your room, we really clean your room. You know, we, there's Clorox and there's robots that shoot UV lasers and it's all kinds of great stuff. Um, first of all, veterinary teaching hospitals can't afford the robots. But also the, the kennel is never empty. So there's never a, this is just empty, we're gonna hose it down with bleach. So you don't necessarily get that same sort of, you have this sort of continuous fomite exposure thing. Um, that's one of the reasons I'm really interested in it is because I'm like, oh, that, that's, that's weird contact. I, I, I wanna study that. Um, so yeah, it's definitely possible. There's not a huge amount of different species mixing. Um, Mainly, and, and also the, the wildlife we do get, at least at our veterinary teaching hospital, tends to be big wildlife. So that ends up in the large animal side when, you know, or we get a grizzly or something like that, which does happen on occasion. Thank you. Um, all right, are there any other, other questions on any of the three acts of the, the talk? Or things generally. All right. Um, I'm going to say let's please thank Eric again for a really nice lunch and learn seminar. Um, and if you have any follow up questions for him, either on the thing on these things that he's described or in general, if you're interested in in statistical simulation things and epidemiology, um, ah, especially about data. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for coming. Thank you all. Thank you, Eric. That was great. Really Thank you. appreciate it. I appreciate it. Excellent talk. Yeah, so um, so Alan is a uh, pathologist at the vet school. So you might <laughs> run, in, run into him some. Uh, he does a lot of amphibian work. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I'm on a, one of the pathologists. We have a PhD residency program for pathology here at WSU, and I'm on, I'm on someone's committee who's working on elk hoof disease, which I keep calling elf hoof disease, and that's not <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, she, she's working on that. The, the pathologists are fun. Yeah, nice. Of course, we're always fun. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Um, Are there specific grizzly diseases that get treated in large animal hospitals? Like, do you, 
No. So, I mean, some, some of it is, is Grizzly Necropsy. Um, right. And then uh, some of it is we are the closest veterinary teaching hospital. So occasionally if you hit a Grizzly with your car, um, people will show up with essentially a Grizzly in a pickup truck, um, which is awkward because once, you, once a Grizzly has come in contact with humans, they can't be rewilded. So you've sort of just given us a Grizzly for life. Um, <laughs> But but we have a but we good news is we have a grizzly research center um, where we study things mostly about how the cardiovascular system of grizzlies work because I eat an enormous meal and then take a nap is a really bad idea if you're a person and apparently a swell idea if you're a grizzly bear so they're they're trying to figure out why that is but yes we do on very rare occasion get very strange animals um, but yeah for. For the most part, it's still dogs and cats and then occasionally horses. But it is one of the perks of working by the vet school is you can just walk by and be like, is that a llama? And yes, it is. Today we're working on llamas. I, I really love the idea of, of the involuntary gift of a lifelong grizzly. That's yeah. That's way worse than an Easter uh, puppy. A, a grizzly is for life, not just Christmas. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We actually see quite, we see a lot of wildlife here and ours are not grizzlies, but black bear. And um, I think the ones that maybe get a little bit more um, hard to deal with are the ones that if you're trying to prove or disprove that a grizzly fed off of a human. Yeah. <laughs> or a, a black bear in this case. <laughs> um, and I'm sure that that's some of the cases that you all see too. Yeah. Yeah. But interesting COVID. Thank you. <laughs> so, all right. All right. Thank you all very much. Thanks again. Thanks so much. Bye bye.